And the majority of this lesson here is going to center around what we're going to, to lead up to. I'll just give you a roadmap so you can kind of see the big picture. What I'm going to do is explain a little bit about uh, everything we've sort of summarized, everything we've learned up to this point as far as solutions to homogeneous equations, solutions to non-homogeneous equations. Just really simple kind of overview stuff that I know that you remember from the last section. And then what we're going to do is start to talk in detail about the solution set that comes about and, and in specific using what we call this Ronskin test to determine if what we really have in front of us really is truly the general solution of the equation. So that's what we're leading up to. We're, we're really focusing on a laser focus here in this section on understanding this Ronskin test. Now before you get too wrapped up in Ronskin, it sounds really, really hard. Uh, it's named after a person. So Ronskin just, to me anyway, sounds really difficult, but I promise you once we get into it, what I'll do is I'll explain what it is, show you how to use it. It's not going to be that hard. So what we're going to do in this section is I'll give you a little lecture, what we're using it for, why is it important, kind of give you the overview, a couple of sort of quick examples on how you would do it. But then in the next section, what we're going to do is roll up our sleeves and really apply it to a good number of problems, just so you make sure you understand, because you're guaranteed to have these kinds of questions on your test. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so let's do a little bit of review, but when I do these reviews, I really want you to watch them because I'm kind of leading you by the hand, so to speak, up to a very important conclusion. So don't fast forward past this part, even if you've already seen this before. All right, so in general, we talked about this a lot in the last section. Remember that we have, in general, we have these, the general form of a differential equation, a linear differential equation, is what we call non-homogeneous, right? And that means that you have the stuff on the left-hand side, but on, that on the right-hand side of the equal sign, we have a function of time. That's what we call non-homogeneous. And we talked in, a, in great detail in the last section that in general, in general, Uh, for non-homogeneous uh, equation, which we are going to refer to from now on as n, because writing non-homogeneous is just really cumbersome. So parentheses n is going to mean non-homogeneous. Uh, the solution, the solution is of the following form. This should not be anything new, different, or anything to stress you out because we've already talked about it quite a bit. But I'm going to lead you up to a conclusion. So we said that the solution in general of a differential equation that's non-homogeneous is going to be CH of T plus P of T. And just to refresh your memory, uh, this guy is the solution this is basically the contribution uh, of the non-homogeneous part of the equation. So remember, uh, of the homogeneous part. Non-homogeneous means that on the right-hand side of the equal sign, you have a pure function of time. Uh, but if you take that away and just stick a zero there, then we have what we call the homogeneous version. So when you solve this general equation, you just always get a solution of this form, where you end up getting a, a, a constant times a bunch of little functions um, how many of these little functions that you end up having, h1, h2, and h3, we talked about in the last section, is really just going to depend on how many derivatives you have, what, what the highest derivative is in your differential equation. But this is the solution to the homogeneous version. So if we take our original equation, strip off the right-hand side, the function of time, stick a zero in there, this is really the solution of that. This guy is what we call a particular solution. solution to the non-homogeneous version. So if you really think about it for a second, since this is the solution to the homogeneous version, then if I take uh, this guy here, if I plug it back in to the, the uh, homogeneous version of this differential equation, the, the, the version that has a zero on the right-hand side, it will satisfy that equation, right? This little function that pops up that we did some examples in the last section, if you take this and plug it into the full version, the, the uh, non-homogeneous version of the differential equation, then you'll, it'll satisfy this guy. When we take them and add them together, it's like this is the contribution, the particular part for the, for the uh, guy with the forcing function when, when the right-hand side's not zero. This is the contribution to, to the form of the equation when we, when we don't have any forcing function when the right-hand side is equal to zero. Okay, so that's sort of a review of one little thing, but it's super important. 
All right, now the next thing is, in general, uh, for the homogeneous version, the solution is, and we already just said it here, I'm just gonna really rewrite it because I'm gonna lead up to something important. If it's, if it's truly homogeneous to begin with, then x of t is just gonna equal ch of t. Now remember, when I write ch of t, what I mean is constant one times h1 of t plus constant two times h2 of t plus constant three times h3 of t. How many of these terms you have is just gonna depend on the, the number of derivatives in your differential equation. Third order, in other words, a, th a third derivative is gonna have three of these guys. Uh, second derivative, the highest derivative is gonna have two of them and so on. All right, so to refresh your memory of this fact, because it's super important for what we're going to discuss here in just a minute, let me give you just a really quick example. All right, so let's look at a simple first order uh, homogeneous equation, which means the right-hand side is going to be equal to zero. So if we wanted to look at that and just study it a little bit, let's say we had dx dt is equal to zero. This is probably the simplest differential equation you could possibly have. It's homogeneous because the right-hand side is just equal to zero. On the left-hand side, you just have a single derivative, and it's just a first derivative. So to solve this, I think you've all been doing this long enough to know, that I can just simply integrate dx dt over dt. So integrate the left-hand side over dt. And on the right-hand side, I can just also integrate over dt. So basically, I'm just integrating both sides of this equation uh, over t, over dt which is perfectly fine to do. I can do whatever I want to both sides of an equation, right? So on the left-hand side, if you have a derivative and you integrate that guy, you're just gonna get the original function back because integral is opposite of derivative, right? So you're gonna have x of t on the left, and on the right-hand side, what do you get when you integrate zero? If you think about that for a second, you're just gonna get a constant, right, uh, here. So for this super, super, super simple case, we have a single derivative and a zero on the right-hand side, which means it's homogeneous, right, then what we get as a solution is just equal to a constant. Now when you think about it, this is like h1 of t is just equal to one in this case. What I'm trying to point out to you is the general form of any homogeneous equation is always gonna be a series of constants times these functions that we get. So you can always identify what's the homogeneous solution because it's gonna be a bunch of additions of these, these little functions times constants, functions times constants. Well here, the answer we got was simply a constant, so the function associated with it is just the number one that's sitting out in front of it. So I'm just proving to you that, yes, this is a real example. It really does follow the form of this guy. All right, now let's look at one just a little more complicated. Okay, so let's look at a simple second order. homogeneous equation, just to prove to ourselves that even the a little bit more complicated ones doing the same thing. All right, so let's look at the next most simplest thing we can do. So d squared x dt squared is equal to zero. So again, these are not, these problems are not here to teach you how to solve differential equations. We're just trying to lead up to a conclusion. So if we integrate both sides of this, so we'll integrate d squared x dt squared, right? Let's say we integrate that over dt. And on the right-hand side, we'll integrate zero over dt. So here we have a second derivative and we're integrating it right over the same variable. So what we're going to get when we do that is uh, a first derivative. So we'll end up getting dx dt on the left-hand side because we have a second derivative. We integrate it once, we get a first derivative. On the right-hand side, we're gonna get this constant. So the right-hand side is the same as we got before because we just integrate this guy, right? But we want to know what x of t is, right? So let's go ahead and integrate this again. So if we integrate the left-hand side, dx dt, we integrate it over dt. So we're just integrating the left-hand side. The right-hand side, we integrate this constant over dt. And then we'll find the, the real solution to this guy. So what we're going to have, let me switch colors back to black. The left-hand side here, we're just gonna get x of t. We're in, integrating that first derivative. On the right-hand side, we're gonna get, this is just a constant, don't forget. So we'll have c times t plus a new constant of integration. 
So think about this. We just have this guy. We integrate it, this guy, over dt. So we're going to get c times t. That's this. We have a constant of integration anytime we integrate, which is d. You could call them c1, c2, c3. That's, that's, that's fine. A lot of books really do it that way. I like to use c and d a lot of times because it just, it's just easier for me to read. So this is the solution right, of the uh, differential equation. Now look at what we have found. Here's a constant. Here's a constant. Here we have a function of time. Here we really also have a function of time. It's just a, a, a number one, so it's really a constant. So this guy, you might say, is, um, let me go ahead and do this. This is what we're going to call C1, uh, H1 of t. And this guy, in the, in, the, in the usual notation of a textbook, would be like C2, H2 of t. Again, I'm just proving to you, coming back to this, we're saying all homogeneous equations have this form. This is a shorthand way of writing it. It's a constant times some function of time plus another constant times another function of time. And you're going to get keep adding these guys together as many derivatives as you have in your equation. Here we have a second order differential equation. When we actually solve it, we get exactly that form. Constant 1 times function of time plus constant 2 times a function of time. Right? So I'm just showing you that the real solution of these, of these uh, homogeneous equations really are uh, what we call, I'm going to introduce a term here, a linear combination of these functions h of t. So here the, the function h1 of t is just t. Here the other function h2 of t is just the number 1. And so if you had a fifth order equation or a 17th order differential equation, if it was homogeneous like that, then you would just keep integrating until you get all the way to the end. And you can kind of see the pattern here. As you have more and more derivatives, you're going to keep integrating over and over and over. Each time you're going to introduce a new constant of integration. So in the end, when you look at your whole solution, you're going, if you have five fifth order equation with a fifth derivative in there, you're going to have five of these little terms running around, right? Which really corresponds to exactly what I'm saying right here. If you have tenth order equation, you're going to have ten of these little terms. So it's really a linear combination. When we say linear combination, very important. What we mean is we're summing these guys together. We're summing these functions together. The functions that are sitting here, we're summing them together. We're allowed to put constants in front of them, unknown constants even, just like these. That's what we call linear combination. So um, you just need to kind of remember that because your book is going to talk about linear combination of functions, linear combination of functions. You need to know we're just adding the functions together, but we're allowed to put constants in front. That's what we call linear combination. So now that we have that out of the way, we need to start easing our way into, uh, into getting to the, the point at hand. But before we do that, I want to just show you, just to nail it home, if we had a third order guy, and that was equal to zero, I'll sort of leave it as an exercise to the reader, so to speak, and I usually don't do this, but I think we've seen enough of a pattern. If you were to integrate this, and integrate it again, and integrate it again, then what you would get as a solution is x of t, I think it's pretty easy for you to see here, c over 2t squared plus dt plus e, right? So this guy would be... Um, h1 of t, this guy would be h2 of t, and this number one that's really sitting out here is h3 of t. Now the way we get this is exactly before. If you integrate this guy, you're going to get a constant. That's really going to be, that's going to be this original c. When you integrate him again, it's going to be uh, c times t, you know, for this term. When you integrate him a third time, it's going to be uh, one half times c times t squared. So if you keep integrating it, basically if you look at this guy, if you integrate him one more time is really all we've done. If you integrate this, you're going to get c over 2 t squared. If you integrate this, you're going to get d times t. And then you're going to have a constant of integration off at the end if we integrate it again, which will be e. So all we've done really is we've integrated this again because it's third order. We get this. And I'm just showing you that the pattern holds. You have three uh, functions of time preceded by three constants. So we say this is a linear combination. Don't forget, don't worry about the fact that it's c over 2 because it's still just a constant out in front. I mean, in fact, if it's divided by 2, it doesn't matter. It's still just a number out there. So you have constant times function plus constant times function plus constant times function. I'm harping on this a lot um, because here in a minute, you know, it's going to be, um, it's going to be very, very important. So what I want to do now 
is write down some general observations that are really, really important uh, for these guys. So what I'm going to do is start on a new board. And what we're going to do is we've talked about some of these things, but we really need to make sure we understand them. Observations. Okay. All right, the first guy. X of t, which is the solution of the, of the differential equation, of the homogeneous guy. So these are really observations for any uh, nth order homogeneous differential equation, which is what we've sort of been doing some examples. The solution is comprised of what we just talked about a minute ago, a linear combination. I'm going to underline that because it's really important. So it's comprised of a linear combination of functions. And we call them, you know, h1 of t, h2 of t, dot, 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 depending on how many derivatives you really have. Okay, so we'll switch colors to try to make it a little bit more readable. That's just something we've already said, but a lot of times in your book you'll see these things summarized. I want to make sure you understand. So for an nth order a homogeneous ordinary differential equation, there are n uh, functions in the general solution. Okay, so an example of that is, is sort of what you already know, but if it's a second order equation, let's say it's second order, then the solution is um, C1 times H1 of T plus C2 times H2 of T. But we've also said if it was like a third order, then the solution would be C1, H1 of t, plus C2, H2 of t, plus C3, H3 of t. Again, it's really something we've already said. How, whatever order you have is gonna be the number of terms you have. That's really what's, what you're reading here. When you see this in a book though, I mean, I know I at least feel this way sometimes, you read these guys and you're like, oh my gosh, all these things, second order gives this, third order gives this. Where does this come from you might be looking at? Well, that's why I did those examples a minute ago to show you that it's nothing, it's not rocket science, it's just that if you keep integrating a, a homogeneous equation, you're just gonna keep getting more and more terms. That's really, what, and you have to integrate, uh, you know, three times for a third order, so you're gonna get three of these guys out here, okay? Let me go ahead and switch back and give you another little bullet point that's really important. The general solution of this homogeneous equation that we've been talking about can't be formed with fewer than in functions h of t. And what I mean by that is as an example, okay, as an example, for instance, let's say I had a third order equation with a third derivative. Let's say somebody told me, hey, the solution to this guy is x of t is equal to some constant times some function of time plus some other constant times some other function of time. Before this class, you might have said, okay, that makes sense. But what I'm telling you now is, and from here on out, the first two things we've talked about a lot, from here on out is going to be sort of some new things. It's going to inch our way. You're going to say, oh, that makes sense. That's because I'm trying to inch our way forward a little bit. But really from here on is something that I've never really explicitly told you, but you may have figured out on your own just by doing this enough. What we're saying here is if you have a third order equation with a third derivative, it's impossible for the solution to only have two terms like that. And that's really, really important. Um, it's something that kind of falls out when you see these examples that, okay, 
First derivative means one term. Second derivative means two terms. I gave you a board a minute ago. Third derivative means three terms. So I've kind of showed you that, but this is a more powerful statement. It's saying that the general solution, which don't forget, when we write this down, this is the general solution of this homogeneous equation. It cannot be formed with fewer than n number of functions. So for you know, third order, it's going to be three of these guys summed together, a linear combination of three of these functions. If it's a fifth order, it's going to be five of them summed together. If it's a 17th order, it's going to be 17 of them summed together. That's really important for what we're about to say here in a little bit as well. So just put that in your back pocket. It's really impossible to form what we call the general solution that describes the entire solution with fewer than n number of these guys uh, in the solution, n number of these terms basically. So for the fourth thing, each individual function h of t, so it could be h1, h2, h3, whatever, is itself a solution to this equation, to the homogeneous equation that we're talking about. So I'll rewrite it and say that is, just to kind of rewrite it a little bit, using our operator notation that we learned in the last section, if I have a differential equation, I represent it as a differential operator. If I take that operator and I plug in any one of these functions, h1, h2, h3, doesn't matter. That's why I have a subscript n. I take any one of those individual, not the whole thing, I'm talking about one of these guys, and plug it into the, to the equation that we originally have you're going to get zero, which means it does satisfy it. Um, and, and that's what we mean when we say it is itself a solution. So again, this is not something I've specifically told you. This is a new thing here. So try to make sure you really understand it. Um, it makes sense to you when we integrate this guy and I tell you that this is the solution and you believe that because we've just solved it, right? But I'm telling you something further here. What I'm saying is this guy, this is a constant. This guy is what we're calling h1 of t. It's one of these little functions that is equal to t. This guy is just a number one, but it's really the second function. What I'm telling you is that each one of these functions individually, forgetting the fact that they're added together here in the total solution, individually, they're individually also a solution to the original equation. And you can actually see that here. h1 of t is equal to t. Take this guy, plug it back into our original differential equation. Take two derivatives of t right? You're going to get zero, so it satisfies the original differential equation. This guy is d, but the constant out here is just a one. Take the number one, which is our function of time, h2 of t, take it and plug it in here. Take two derivatives of the number one, you're just going to get a zero again, and so it also satisfies that differential equation. That's really, really important for you to know, because think about this, for, for homogeneous equation, the right-hand side is always equal to zero. So if, if what we're really saying is that if each of these little functions that comprise the solution is, is, is a, itself a solution of the differential equation, that means when we plug it in here, we get zero. We plug this function in here, we get zero. If this were a higher order and we had you know, 10 of these functions strung together, each one of them, when we plug them in, would be equal to zero because they satisfy the equation. So if I put this in and I get zero, and I put this in and get zero, and if it were higher order, if I had 10 other terms and I individually put them in, and each time I put them in, they give me zero, like that, then that means that since each term gives me zero and satisfies the equation, then if I add them all up together, then as a unit, they also satisfy the equation because that's going to return zero also. That's really important for you to know. This, when you plug it in, gives you zero. This, which is one, when you plug it in, gives you zero. That means that if I add these guys together, it looks like it's totally different, but since this is giving me zero, this is giving me zero then I can sum them together and say, okay, this is a superset solution. Any linear combination of these functions, see these constants can be anything I want, is going to give me the entire solution space that when I put it in there is going to also give me zero. So wrap your brain around that for a second because it actually is quite important. The homogeneous equation means the right hand side is zero. When we solve it by whatever means we have, and in, in the next couple of sections, we're going to learn techniques to solve homogeneous equations that you have never learned before. These are really simple integrations, but they're in general not going to be simple integrations. When you get that solution, what I'm telling you here on this board is, is four really, really important things. 
The solution is always going to be comprised of a linear combination of these functions here that we get. All right. If you have a fourth order equation, you're going to get four of these terms. If you have a fifth order, you're going to have five of them. That's what number two is saying, really. Number three, you cannot form the general solution, which describes everything, when you have fewer than n functions for an nth order equation. You have to have as many terms as you have the highest derivative. And the fourth thing is that each one of these individual little functions that comprise the sum of the linear combination is itself a solution, which makes total sense. At first, that was hard for me to understand when I took this class years ago. But it makes sense because we're talking about homogeneous equations. So if I plug this guy into the equation and I get 0, and I plug this guy into the equation and, I, and it satisfies it, so I get 0, then of course if I add them together and plug this guy as a unit back into the differential equation, I'm also going to get 0 because the derivative operator is linear. So the derivative applies term by term. So it's, it's not going to matter if you plug them in individually or if you plug them in together. It's going to satisfy that, that differential equation. All right, so what we want to do now is uh, take it one step further. And what I want to do now is erase this board and draw some more conclusions and really get to this Ronskin test that we've been talking about. OK, so what I've done is I've given you four observations. First two we kind of knew. The second two we didn't explicitly say, but they make sense, I think. I'm going to give you a fifth one here, and I need a whole board for it because I'm going to, you know, it's very easy to just write down what it is, but I want to give you a little proof to show you. Uh, when we're talking about these functions, h1, h2, h3, that comprise the general solution, uh, number five says that these functions, these functions, uh, h1 of t, h2 of t, dot, 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 are, and I'm actually going to switch colors to tell you what the term is because it's so incredibly important. Uh, you will be tested on this for sure. They are what we call linear linearly independent. And I'm going to go ahead and underline that. And this is something that, um, you know, I'm going to show you an example of what I mean by this, and, and I'm going to tell you what this means. But um, what it basically means is that these, when you actually solve it and you get the, the full solution, right, these little functions are not just random functions pulled out of thin air. I mean, you know that. When you solve the equation, the solution is the solution. These guys have got to be specially chosen so that when we sum them together, it expresses all possible solutions of this differential equation, right? So this is an infinite set because it's homogeneous. We have constants out front. These constants are going to be nailed down with our initial conditions, which can literally be anything. If I have a spring, I might pull it back this far, might pull it back this far, I might pull back this far. I might push it initially. I might pull it initially. There's an infinite number of initial conditions. So there's an infinite number of, of real solutions, each one corresponding to a different initial condition, right? That's why there's an infinite number of them. But these functions, they're not just pulled out of thin air. They have to be a little bit special because they're able to describe the entire solution of an infinite magnitude of our equation. So the, the word that we use to describe the fact that they're special, so to speak, we say that they're linearly independent. And it turns out that all solutions of these homogeneous equations, all of these functions are what we call linearly independent. You might think of the word independent, right, in everyday language. It means somebody is on their own. It means somebody is self-sufficient, right? It means somebody is good at doing things by themselves. That's what independent means. So you can kind of think of that term really does apply to this. It means these functions are kind of self-serving on their own. It means that they're, it means that these functions, they're not dependent on any other functions in order to be a part of that solution. And you'll see what I mean when I say that, that sentence right here. Let me go ahead and give you a definition of what linearly independent is. Linearly independent, frequently in books, you might see it abbreviated as LI. So kind of get used to seeing that, LI. So that's, that's what we call linearly independent, right? What this means is that any function, hn of t, can't, and actually I'm going to erase this. It's so important. One word changes the entire definition, can't. So I'm going to underline that. These guys cannot be written as a linear combination of the other functions. 
other h of t functions. Now I know you're, you're reading this and you're like, what is he talking about? This makes no sense. Just, just bear with me for a second. I need to write the other definition now and I'll give you an example. This will be so easy you'll, you'll uh, wonder why it's so complicated in your book. Linearly dependent, let me go ahead and underline these guys so you know their difference. This is linearly independent. The opposite of that would be linearly dependent, right? When something is linearly dependent, it means that you can write h, one of these uh, little functions, h of t, as a combination, combo, I'll just say, of the other functions. So this is the guy here. I'm going to write one more sentence down because I just really like it and I think it, it boils down to it. What we're really saying with this linearly independent, we're saying these functions h of 2, h1, h2, h3, when you solve an equation and you get them, they're linearly independent from one another. What it means in layman's terms is h1 of t, h2 of t, h3 of t, dot, 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 dot. They are what we call, or in my words really, fundamental. In other words, any one of these functions that you get when you solve a differential equation, like this function here, it's not able to be expressed or it's not dependent on any of these other functions. It's truly independent, um, which if you read the definition again, you know, when, when you read these definitions in books, even these that I have up on the board, I've tried to make it clear. You know, when you read a real differential equations book, the definitions for linear independence can be really, really obtuse. But even when you read these, it can be a little bit hard to understand. But what I'm trying to say is that any of these functions, for, if it's linearly independent, it cannot be written as a combination of the other functions in the solution. It cannot be written as a combination of the other functions in the solution. But if it is linearly dependent, then you can write any one of these guys as a combination of the other functions. So what we're really saying here is that since all of these functions are linearly independent, that are solutions, that they're, they're uh, they're special, they're truly fundamental from one another. Uh, and so let me give you an example here to show you what this really means so that it'll, it'll, it'll nail it down for you here. All right, let's say that um, from an example from before, we just did this a minute ago, the solution of a differential equation, we just got it before. Let's say we have some constant times t squared plus some other constant times t plus some other constant. Actually, in the board before, it was c over 2t squared plus d times t plus e. But they're all constants, and even the one here, it was c over 2, but that's just another constant. You can relabel it. So really, it's a constant times t squared plus constant times t plus constant. This was the solution to that second order really, really simple equation. So it's a real solution, right? So what we're saying is, since all of these guys should be linearly independent, that these functions, these h1, h2, and h3, they should be linearly independent from one another. So let's look at that and see what it, what it means. What we're saying here is that, let's write it out, h1 of t is equal to what's over here, t squared. So let me draw a little line. h2 of t is equal to what's over here, which is t. Let me draw another little line, h3 of t is equal to what's over here, just next to the constant, which is just one, right? So in big letters, I'll just write, these are linearly independent. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Let's read the definition. What you need to do is look at this and say, can this function, t squared, be written as a linear combination of the other functions I have in my, in, that comprise of my solution, right? This is t squared. So remember, when I say linear combination, I don't mean you can do anything. I'm just saying that you can take these guys and you can add them together with constants out in front. But there's no way that I can write t squared as a linear combination of this. I mean, yeah, I could, you might say, oh, you can take h2 and square it. That's not linear. Linear combination means I take this guy and add it to this guy, and I can put constants in front of them. But if I put a constant in front of here and a constant in front of here, there's no way that it's going to equal t squared, right? So let's look at this one. Can this function be written as a combination of the other two? The answer is no. There's no way that I, I mean, I can take the square root of this, sure, but that's not linear. Linear combination means I can take this plus this with constants out in front, and there's, you can just see there's no way I can do that and make it equal to t. And the same thing holds true of the third one. Can I, can I take this function 
and rewrite it as a combination of these two summed together with constants in front. That's what linear combination means. There's no way it's possible. So when we say this, it means this function is truly independent from the other two. This function is truly independent of the other two. This function is truly independent of the other two. Independent, independent, independent. We say they're linearly independent. That's what that definition means. And it's really confusing when you read most books. They're trying to get across a very simple, simple, simple thing. I've seen it written many, many ways. Really all they're trying to say is, these guys, if they're really a solution to a differential equation, by definition, they will be linearly independent because they're fundamental solutions. If this could be rewritten as a combination of the other two, then I wouldn't really truly have three independent h functions, h of t functions. I would have one of them that was kind of hamstrung because it would be just a combination of the other two. To truly be a general solution of a differential equation, each little part that's summed together must truly be independent of the other parts. That's what we talk about when we say they are linearly independent from one another. So with that in mind, let me show you an example of what it is when two things really are not linearly independent. Let's see what they look like, an example of when they are, are linearly dependent, so you can just sort of at least see what that looks like. All right, let's say we had another couple of um, uh, h functions. Let's say we had h1 of t is equal to 2t squared. Let's say we had h2 of t is equal to t squared. Let's say we have h3 of t is equal to t. All right, so let's look at that for a second. Let's say this is h1, h2, and h3. It's a third order equation. Now, before this lesson, I might tell you, yeah, you can write the general solution as a, as a linear combination, c times this plus c, uh, c2 times this plus c3 times this, and you might say, okay, that sounds great. But now I'm telling you, they need to be linearly independent in order to even have a chance to be a real solution. And you can see right away that um, in this case, h1 of t, which is this, can be written as 2 times h2 of t. Look at that. This is t squared. This is 2 times t squared. So this guy right here, even though it kind of looks different, it is not different because uh, it may be, and in fact, this may be a solution to our equation. This may be also a solution to our equation. This may also be a solution to our equation. But this one can be written in terms of another one. So it's not truly fundamental. It's not truly independent. It's not linearly independent. It's called linearly dependent, right? Let me give you one more real quick. Let's say we had uh, h1 of t is equal to t, h2 of t is equal to 2, h3 of t is equal to 2 times t plus 6. Are these linearly independent functions? Are these linearly independent functions? Could these comprise the general solution of, a, of an ordinary differential equation? Is another way you might see that asked on your test. Well, when you look at it, you can see right away that h3, right? It can just be written as 2 times h1 of t plus 3 times h2 of t. Right? Because 2t plus 6, 2 times this guy, 2t, that's what I'm getting here, plus 3 times 2, 3 times h2 is going to give me the 6. So even though they might look totally different from one another, this one is really able to be rewritten as a linear combination of the other two, so it's not truly fundamental. So it's impossible for it to be the general solution to a differential equation. It's impossible for all three of them to comprise if I wrote them out as, as, that, as that long linear combination, it's impossible for that to truly represent all of the solutions of that differential equation because they're not really independent of one another. Okay, And that's what we said here. The functions that are the solutions, h1, h2, and so on, they're always linearly independent if they're solutions to these guys. So we say that these are not linearly independent. Or you might want to also say that they're, they are linearly dependent. And that's how you would sort of write this on your test. So they cannot complete the general solution of that differential equation. A complete general solution must consist of a linear combination of independent functions. So that's what's going to really um, comprise the rest of the section here. I'm going to We've learned a lot along the way here. We've learned about how the solution looks. We've learned about linearly independent. We've learned about linearly dependent. We've learned about really all the little things that we've observed about how these solutions are really put together for homogeneous equations. The rest of the section is going to be talking about um, what we call a Ronskian test. 
it's a test to figure out if these solutions are linearly independent or not. Because you see, these, this is pretty easy. You can look at these three and you can say, well, this one can be written as a combination of these two. This one can be written as a combination of these other two over here. So that's pretty easy, but that's only because I've chosen really easy, easy guys to show you what we're talking about. If you get much more complicated H of T functions, it might not be so obvious if they're linearly independent or not. So there's a test that was invented a long, long time ago. It's called the Ronskian test. And then basically what it does is it figures out for you if they're truly linearly independent or not. So it really tells you, and it, um, it, it basically tells you if those guys are capable of, of, of supporting the full solution set of the differential equation, because if they're not linearly independent, then they're definitely not going to be able to be the, the whole general solution. So basically on your test, or on your exams, or in your homework, uh, some point when you get to talking about the Ronskian, the professor is going to give you a list of H of T functions, H1, H2, H3, H4, whatever. And he'll ask you, uh, maybe one of two questions worded differently. The first one he might ask is, are these linearly independent functions? Right? All you have to do is apply the Ronskian test. I'm about to show you what it is. Okay? So that's easy. Another thing you might say slightly differently is, are these functions H1, H2, H3, whatever, um, capable of supporting the general solution? Or are they capable of forming the true general solution of this ordinary differential equation? Right? Or of a ordinary differential equation. But the way you handle it is the same thing. You take them and you put them into the Ronskian test because basically they need to be linearly independent in order to form the solution. So you might see the, the question worded two different ways, but it's really the same thing. What we need to do is the Ronskian matrix test. And the reason that I'm writing matrix here is because you end up using a matrix in the test. But really and truly, um, you know, when you read about the Ronsky in the books, it looks really, really, really difficult, but it's really not difficult. Trust me on this. You'll see in just a second. So what we're going to do is, what I'm going to do is write it down. It's going to look like complete gobbledygook, but we'll make it very, very easy. So you have to bear with me a little bit here. This is how it's usually written in a book. Ronskin, W stands for Ronskin, of, or bracket, H1, h2 dot 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 h sub n. So this is the functions we're talking about, h1, h2, h3, h4, all the way to however many I have, right? The Ronskian matrix, that's what this bracket means, evaluated at t naught, which is just some function of time, I'll explain what, what we're talking about here, is, is equal to, this is the test I'm talking about, it's equal to the determinant of a matrix. So you all remember what a determinant is, at least in theory. Um, and the way I form the matrix is as follows. I take h of 1, h1 of t, evaluated at t naught, this, this number here that I'm going to tell you in a minute what it means. Next to it in the matrix, I put h2, evaluated at t naught. And I may have some more functions here depending on the order of my differential equation that I have, but eventually I'm going to get to the last h of n of t naught. So I put them all across the top. That's really all I'm trying to tell you. h1, h2, h3, h4, however many you have, they go on the top row of the matrix. And they're evaluated at t naught. I'll explain what that means in just a second. Underneath this one, you take its first derivative. So you have h1 prime at t naught. Over here, you have the same thing. h2 prime at t naught. Dot, dot, dot. I may have a whole bunch of these if I have a high order system, but eventually you're going to get to the last one. You're going to take the derivative at t naught. What do you think you're going to have under this? Well, if you took the first derivative in this row, the next row is going to be the second derivative, then the third derivative, then the fourth derivative, and eventually you're going to get to the point, this is how it's written in the books, dot, 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 h sub 1 of n minus 1 um, evaluated at t naught, and then next to it you'll have uh, h2 n minus 1 evaluated at t naught, and then dot, 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 and then you'll have h sub n evaluated n minus 1, t naught. And this is where the Ronskin gets a bad rap because this is how it's, this is literally how it's plastered in your, in your book. They say, oh, here's the Ronskin matrix test. Isn't it beautiful? And you look at it and you're like, what is this? This is so complicated. But it is not complicated. This is what you do to do a Ronskin test to see if you have linearly independent functions. You're going to be given functions, h1, h2, h3. You're going to be asked one of two things. Are they linearly independent? Or you might be asked, are, do they form the general solution of this differential equation? Which is the same question, just worded differently, right? So 
what you do is you form a matrix. Just draw your brackets. You write H1, H2, H3 on the top. You take the first derivative underneath it, and you keep on going uh, down the way until you take basically one less derivative of the order that you have. So, for instance, if you have a uh, third order system with a third derivative in there, then you'll have the first guy on the top, you'll have the first derivative, and then you'll have the second derivative. So you take n minus one derivatives. Basically, you need to have a square matrix in the end because you have to have a square matrix to take a determinant because you're going to be taking the determinant of this whole thing. So you just keep taking derivatives until basically you arrive at a square matrix, basically. If you forget what the real rule is, you just end up taking them until you end up with a, the same number of rows as columns. Now, once you take these derivatives, you need to evaluate each term by what I keep writing over and over again, T naught. This is any value of time that you, in my course here, I'm talking always about a value of time, but you know that if your differential equation is, you know, dy dx, then it's the, in, it's the other variable on the bottom. It would be x in your case. But it's easy for me to visualize in terms of time because I think about spring systems that move in time and things like that. So just keep that in mind. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're specifying some point in time to evaluate this matrix at. But the nice thing is you can pick any point you really want as long as the differential equation is well behaved or normal on, you know, at that point. So most differential equations that you solve in a, in a class like this, they're going to be well behaved. So you can pretty much pick almost any value of time that you want. And what you're going to find, and this is really important, so listen carefully, what you're going to find is you're almost always going to use zero for this value of time. It's going to depend on what you have in here. But basically, you just pick a value that's easy to evaluate. Uh, and when we do the problems, you'll see how clear it becomes what value of time to pick. You might pick zero for t is equal to zero because it makes this math really look easy. You might pick one if when you plug one in here all of these terms become really simple but you can really pick anything you want as long as the differential equation is well defined on that guy. Okay so what you do is you pick this value of time and I'm going to write this uh, right here can be uh, any convenient point to eval, right? So you form this matrix out of your H of t's. You evaluate each term at the same value of time. Uh, you have the derivatives in there and all that stuff. And so then at that point, since you're evaluating everything at a value of time, you're going to have a matrix full of numbers at that point, just numbers. You take the determinant of that matrix, which you can use your calculator for. I mean, everybody watching this has a calculator that can take the determinant of a matrix. Uh, you know, you can do it by hand if you want to as well. And when you take that determinant, you're going to get a number back. Remember, when you take a determinant of a matrix, you get one number back. And that number that you get back is going to tell you if you've passed or failed this Ron scan test. So the test is the following. If, and this is how it's written in the book, so I'm going to write it the same way. Your book may be slightly different. I'm just trying to help you understand the notation. H2 h n, let me go ahead and erase this guy, dot 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 h n, evaluated at t naught, if it's equal to zero, if the determinant that you get is equal to zero, then it's not a complete solution set for this ordinary differential equation, which is exactly the same thing as saying it is not linearly independent solutions. So they're not independent. They're not those fundamental solutions that are truly different from one another. So it's impossible to form the complete solution if your determinant comes back to be exactly equal to zero. Okay, now if, this is the case number two, if the Ronskin, I'm just gonna put this stuff in here because you see it in your book like this usually, H1, here's an H1 right there, H2, dot, 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 Hn, evaluated at this guy. This means, the Ron scheme means the determinant of this matrix evaluated at T naught. If it's not equal to zero, it doesn't matter what it's equal to, but if it's anything other than zero, then you can probably guess what it's going to be. It means, it, this makes the complete general solution. Uh, to 
this ODE, which is exactly the same thing as saying that these are linear independent functions. So now we have enough to summarize everything. And we're going to do a lot of problems like this. What basically you do, you're given some functions and the professor will say, hey, are these linearly independent? Or they might say, hey, can these form the solution set of this differential equation? So you put them in the top of a matrix. You keep taking derivatives till you get a square matrix. You evaluate every term you have at any value of time you want. Usually you use t is equal to zero. Maybe you'll use t is equal to one. So you're gonna have a matrix full of numbers at that point. You take the determinant by hand or with your calculator and you're gonna get a single number back. If that number is zero, then it means these guys were not linearly independent. They're not the complete solution, no way, no how. If you get uh, a determinant of 54 or a determinant of of nine or a determinant of 10 or anything other than zero, then you know that this guy did pass the test. They are linearly independent functions. It does form the complete general solution. And that's basically it. What we're going to do in the next section is actually work some problems. Now, even though I've tried to explain it so carefully, I totally realize that um, you know it looks complicated. But once we do the problems, you'll find very, very easily that when you get in here and you take this determinant, it's really not that bad to figure this stuff out, and you'll understand that here in a second. Also notice I didn't bother to prove this at all because you know, I have to, to judge in this course what I need to focus on. And at this point, you know, I could prove it. There is a proof. Your book is going to have some words on why it works. Basically what it boils down to is you're, you're looking at these functions and you're taking these derivatives, and it has to do with with matching it up to the initial conditions. It has to do with making sure that these functions that you've chosen, when you put them together in a linear combination, are able to be matched up with every possible initial condition that we could throw at this differential equation. Now the magic of the determinant of the matrix kind of does all that for you behind the scenes, and, and the result is what's really important. So I've chosen not to focus and give you a long lecture on why it works, because you're very, very likely not gonna be asked to show that on a test, but you will definitely be asked to apply it. You'll definitely be given H1, H2, H3, and to prove if they're linearly independent or not, to prove that they, can, they could be the general solution of this differential equation. That's what's most important. So we're gonna close this section for now. Next section, we're gonna really roll up our sleeves, put some real problems on the board, and really you know, make this determinant work for us and show that these guys may or may not be general solutions. So go ahead and watch that section now. Make sure you understand this. We do the problems here in a few minutes. It'll be really simple for you. And I think you'll find that this Ronskin test, even though it has a really uh, confusing sounding name, really is not very difficult at all. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.